I'm Shyan Mohanty. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Watchful, and we're building what we call the machine teaching platform for the enterprise. Now, today I'm going to be talking about why hand labeling sucks and what we can do to make it suck a little less. So um, let's talk about like why even label. So I, I think this is going to be a review for most people here, but um, when we talk about AI in the enterprise, we're generally talking about supervised machine learning, which I'm going to paint with a really broad brush here, but we're generally talking about algorithms that learn from examples. So you give it enough examples of how to do a thing, it learns how to do that thing. So as a result, labeled data is necessary for training really any type of supervised model. And in general, this data is labeled by hand, typically by an army of humans that's recruited in some capacity or outsourced to. And they're given the raw data, and they hand you back labeled data. Now, this works fairly well in any situation where like, context uh, isn't really necessary, or um, you know, instructions are fairly clear and things like that or if the volume of the data is low, or if the sensitivity of the data is low. But this also feels really archaic. Like, you're doing all this crazy optimization and, and sort of like automation downstream of this. Why is practically the most important part of this all done manually? Um, and, and I think most data scientists in this room, this is sort of a hot take. I think people here have probably either heard or used the term ground truth. Uh, to refer to data labeled by a human, but, but consider this, like, what happens when these humans disagree with one another? How do you determine what truth actually is? And if you wanted to be able to repeat this labeling process and get deterministic results, how would you have to design that system? So there are several problems introduced by hand labeling, and the ones I talked about already are part of them, but uh, in general, we can kind of like bucket them into three categories. Uh, firstly, data labeled by hand is inherently bias prone. Uh, there, there are compounding effects here, ranging from humans just being human uh, and bringing their biases to the table, uh, all the way to the fact that hand labels can't be audited or reproduced. And most high impact models, those that really move the needle for a particular company or those that are you know, of a particular specialty, um, tend to rely very heavily on subject matter expertise in the labeling process. For example, any model that augments doctors or lawyers should probably be trained on data that was output by doctors and lawyers. But these models don't end up getting built a lot of the time because it's cost prohibitive to even get started. Imagine collecting an army of doctors to just label a bunch of data. Like It would be crazy expensive. As you increase the number of people who review a thing, you also increase the likelihood that they're going to disagree about that thing. So labeling teams usually cast these complex relationships aside or try to collapse them into a single categorical label, which really loses the rich shades of gray introduced by those disagreements. And fundamentally, humans are just fallible. Uh, so considering their output ground truth is irresponsible at best and kind of dangerous at worst, depending on the use case. Now, this sort of diagram is meant to show that bias can really start anywhere in an ML system. Uh, there, there are two distinct families of bias shown here, uh, those that are uh, data-centric and those that are modeling-centric. Data-centric biases are some of the hardest to combat, uh, due in large part to the irreproducibility of labels for the data. Measurement bias, for instance, happens at the labeling stage, where the label is an oversimplification of a much more complex concept. Uh, for example, think about like creditworthiness. How would you define creditworthiness to just an army of people? Uh, labels end up being applied inconsistently across labelers simply because it's really difficult to like fully and deterministically articulate the concept of credit creditworthiness to that group of people. But there are also several other vectors for bias to be introduced here, which all affect the labeling process directly. For example, representation bias is where data is sampled inconsistently for labeling. For example, mortgage applications of a certain type are selected for labeling disproportionately more and frequently than other types. And of course, there's you know, things like historical bias, where labelers are bringing their like, stereotypes, their, their, you know, their bias to the table, um, and really just reinforce opinions that may not be in line with real life. 
One of the critical issues facing data-centric bias is the fact that labels can't re what, reliably be reproduced or explained. Concretely, there are a wide number of reasons why a labeler might apply a bad label. Um, you know, ultimately, humans are fallible. Uh, it could be a simple mistake, like they were tired and clicked the wrong button, uh, or something more complex, like the labeling concept was ill-defined, or they were acting on a bias that they weren't even aware of. If it was a mistake, by definition, it's difficult to reproduce those labels. You know, for example, showing the same labeler, uh, the same row or the same piece of data won't necessarily yield the same label. Um, if the labeling concept was ill-defined, again, it would be really difficult to reproduce the labels as there's no guarantee of consistency uh, across individual labelers, let alone a group of them. And as a side effect, it's extremely difficult to narrow in on the specific types of bias being introduced, and therefore it's really difficult to figure out solutions for that bias. Now, there's recently been a huge focus on explainable AI to combat some of these sources of bias, but a lot of these techniques only answer part of the problem. Uh, a lot of explainable AI is centered around like feature importance, for instance, or statistical measures on the data, which really only tell part of the story. Um, for instance, if we're building a model to classify the credit worthiness of applicants, we could use feature, important, uh, fe feature importance measures to determine potential sources of bias in our data, but the bias could actually be encoded at a level higher than explicit features in our data. It could be across latent features, which will be much more difficult to pin down. As another concrete example, let's say we built and deployed a model that does fraud detection. And at the time that we deployed the model, let's say that we are the experts on fraud and we labeled all the data ourselves and we know that this model uh, was trained on data that indicated 2% of the total volume was fraud. And we know that that data was representative of, of, of real life. We put that model into production, the model says, okay, yeah, 2% of the data I'm seeing is fraud. And then we walk away, we do some other things, and we come back a quarter later, and we discover that our model is now telling us that 20% of the data it's seeing is fraud. What happened? Is it that the world shifted out from under us, and now the model's predicting incorrectly? Or is it that we're actually seeing an unprecedented 10x increase in the total amount of fraud cases? We actually don't know unless we take a look at what the model is doing and compare it to what it should be doing, which is, again, a labeling problem. Um, so the only way we can really know these things is by digging in and expending human energy, you know, essentially calories, on applying human knowledge, subject matter expertise to the data and seeing where the model lines up or doesn't. And again, it's fundamentally hard, if not impossible, to get real ground truth in situations that require human interpretation, which makes this whole problem that much more complex. Now, fret not, uh, there are several potential solutions to this. Um, think of this more like a survey. Um, there are lots of different alternatives to hand labeling. Um, now, I'm, I'm gonna start furthest to the left, you know, the things that require the least amount of supervision, but um, take like machine teaching, for example. Uh, machine teaching is a school of machine learning that focuses on the extraction of human knowledge from experts into a form that models can use to learn from. It's a sort of like umbrella concept that lots of techniques like weak supervision fall under. And it's a useful reframing of typical machine learning problems where there's an overemphasis on the learner or creating the best algorithmic student. And instead, machine teaching focuses on how to make the teacher or the human in the loop several orders of magnitude more efficient. Weak supervision is a technique where functions or programs noisily indicate potential labels, which are then aggregated and use the supervision for downstream machine learning models. This technique in particular uh, has been gaining a lot of popularity as it doesn't require any hand label data at all. Though the technique is actually quite hard to reason about a lot of the time, like what is a good heuristic in a world where again, you don't have ground truth? or in a world where you expect that there's going to be noise? What happens when heuristics overlap? What happens when they conflict? Like, how do you reason about those relationships? It's, it's a non-trivial problem. Now, on the exact opposite end of the spectrum, you have the really, really high uh, degrees of supervision systems. So you have things like um, synthetic data generators that may require large quantities of data up front before they're able to output sufficiently useful data. 
These algorithms model the distribution of a data set in order to generate examples stemming from the distribution. And the generated examples aim to have the same statistical validity as the real data. Now, there are caveats here. If the real data is extremely complex, which in many real world cases it is, uh, it's really difficult to have enough data to train an efficient synthetic model. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in a little bit. But um, just know that there are caveats when you get further and further down into the supervision space, as well as on the really, really low amounts of supervision. There, there's reasons why you'd use one over the other. Um, now, transfer learning, on the other hand, promises reduced reliance on labeled data to achieve really high quality results. But in practice, if your task is extremely specific, for example, if you're like fine tuning BERT on a medical use case, uh, you might still require a fair amount of labeled data before you actually achieve the level of performance desired. Finally, semi-supervised learning and by extension active learning promise kind of like a middle ground. Um, they have reduced reliance on hand labeling and really they focus a lot of their effort on keeping uh, the humans engaged at the level of just like annotating one data point at a time, but they focus their time on the right data points. And that's interesting because it kind of feels like the best of both worlds. But uh, again, it, it really comes down to like, what is your distribution in your actual problem space? And again, we'll, we'll talk about this in just a second. So a second's up, let's talk about it. Um, <laughs> uh, the distribution of a problem is extremely important. So these images uh, kind of show the distribution of problems that are fairly common, um, and, and they're, they're across several popular AI research data sets. Um, basically, it's showing the frequency of model classes, and these images indicate that in a lot of these cases, uh, the vast majority of the data actually ends up on the tail of the distribution. So there are rare instances of a class, as opposed to the head, where it's, there's a lot of like simil similarity. Typically, in like purely supervised methods, um, they perform really well on common inputs, like in the head of a distribution, but start to struggle where examples are sparse, like in the tail. Uh, and I think most people here probably already know that. Um, but ignoring the tail can be equally painful. Uh, you could end up with a bad model, which yields poor economics or um, poor user experiences and, and, and things like that, or some combination of the two. Um, and when thinking about labeling data like this, it's important to consider that humans are actually uniquely equipped to deal with problems on the long tail. You know, that's what we excel at. We can take a rare case and we can just look at it and be like, oh, that's clearly class X, uh, whereas models have a harder time of doing that. So it's important to consider just how long tailed your problem is before aligning on techniques for automating the process of arriving at that labeled data. For instance, those problems that skew really heavily towards long tails may not fit an approach like synthetic data generation. On the other hand, a hybrid approach might be good between you know, some higher supervision techniques and some lower supervision techniques along with manual annotation in a smart way. Um, so you kind of have to like balance exactly what your distribution might look like and uh, kind of implement things from there. As I mentioned before, uh, there is a growing area of weak supervision in which subject matter experts specify heuristics that the system can use to make inferences about unlabeled data. As an example, I could write a heuristic that says if an email mentions prescription drugs, it is very likely spam. This would be noisy some percentage of the time, but my doctor might decide to email me about my, my, my prescriptions and, uh, you know, that wouldn't be spam, but this would still be strictly better than, uh, better than random at classifying uh, for certain types of spam. Oftentimes, however, these heuristics are insufficiently intelligent. Uh, adversarial agents like spammers uh, might catch on to some of the patterns that I'm using um, and change tact. So for instance, they might add uh, invisible Unicode characters or symbols or, or spaces and, and so on. Um, now, I could train small models on these slices of data or introduce fuzziness to my heuristics in other ways, but I will usually end up with less interpretable heuristics than if I had just kept the simpler versions. And this can be really expensive in cases like, um, like diagnostic imaging, for instance, where we may need generalizability in our heuristics, 
but where it's still incredibly important for us to be able to interpret why a particular label was applied, these types of approaches might break down or might be called into question. Machine teaching, again, is an umbrella term for techniques like weak supervision and even active learning, uh, where these approaches can, can be combined into a single workflow designed to extract knowledge from the user as quickly as possible. Uh, and again, if, if you're interested in how these things can be combined, I'll be talking all about it in the office hours, um, or you can ask me questions afterwards. Um, now, amidst kind of this like increasing concern about model transparency, we're also seeing calls for algorithmic auditing. As I mentioned before, it's really hard to pin down the why from a model's output since bias could be introduced at multiple points throughout the machine learning workflow. Uh, common explainable AI techniques can provide ways to calculate some parts of the why, uh, you know, from, from the modeling perspective at least. Uh, but they inherently can't go into the why for the data, and that's actually very, very important. Um, machine, te machine teaching techniques like weak supervision uh, more directly encode expertise and hence bias uh, as heuristics and functions, making it easier to evaluate where labeling went awry and why. Um, and when you encode your knowledge as functions, you can easily walk backwards from a label and assess why it was even applied and how it could be changed if needed. If bias is encoded, remedying it is as simple as editing a function. That said, pure weak supervision systems are specifically good at dealing with the head of a distribution, but frankly are really bad at handling the tail. Creating a new heuristic for each unique instance of a class is cumbersome at best and like strictly slower than hand labeling at worst. Uh, on the other hand, subsampling parts of, of the long tail and training models that can generalize well uh, can be an effective strategy for managing this downward pressure. Uh, but may sacrifice auditability. So your mileage may vary depending on uh, the constraints of your task. Um, for instance, you know, how would you audit an ensemble of several models trained on various subsamples of a, of a data set, and how would you detect and mitigate bias introduced by one or more of those models? It's, it becomes like this cascading problem uh, across your ensemble, which you need to deal with intelligently if you're gonna do this. So we've sort of been living in like theory world, and I, I, talk, I talked about like the theoretical problems uh, around hand labeling. Let's make it concrete and talk about like uh, the societal time and financial costs of, of hand labeling. So this is a really, really good book, which I highly recommend, uh, called Ghost Work. Um, so for context, uh, most data labeling services operate large armies of contractors out of low wage countries. Um, you know, while this keeps prices low for consumers of their services, it creates a race to the bottom effect on these wages and, and subsequently creates an underclass of people performing these sorts of, uh, you know, kind of soul-sucking jobs. Um, now, they termed this work ghost work because you don't really see these people and they're not technically part of your organization. Um, now, some of these jobs are simple forms to fill out or images of cars or people or foods, uh, but other times, these are content moderation roles, where these ghost workers are pushed to review shocking content. A lot of companies that employ these types of workers often think, I just need these people for a little while until I'm able to automate this function. But much of the time, that day never comes because high cognition, long tail tasks are notoriously difficult to fully automate, which things like content moderation are. And this is precisely the problem. Uh, that's historically actually been the problem since the industrial age, uh, treating badly people who do the contingent work that can't quite be automated yet. Companies tend to stop paying attention to these people and their work conditions. And this is sort of where we are right now with many parts of the global labeling workforce. So again, I, I highly recommend reading Marielle Gray's uh, Ghost Work, which talks way more about this particular topic. I've got lots of opinions about it, but I've got other things to talk about as well. Um, let's talk about the cost of time. Um, that's probably the biggest one here. Um, for high impact models, many times you can't use a pre-existing labeling service. It's just not possible. Uh, your data might be too sensitive or it might require context that this workforce doesn't have. Um, you might need subject matter experts to be involved in the labeling process, which quickly ends up bottlenecking the entire workflow. 
The bandwidth and time of experts is by far the scarcest resource in the pipeline. And as a scarce resource, much of the time it's not even available. For instance, if you're doing like hot dog, not hot dog type work, it's fairly easy to farm out 10,000 labeled examples to an army of humans on some crowd management platform. That's not a problem. But if you're, doing, if you're looking to do something more specific, like cancer, not cancer, now your army of humans must be specialists. And not just physicians, we're, we're talking about oncologists or radiologists, folks like that. Now, let's imagine, let's do like kind of a thought experiment together. Let's imagine that you have 100,000 MRI images and you have a team of the world's best radiologists and oncologists. They are able to look at, MR, at, a, at an MRI image and within a minute, with 100% accuracy, tell you if it's cancer or not cancer. No problem. You give them this data, and therefore, all of this data just has to be reviews, reviewed once. You know, everyone just looks at one image and is able, able to give you 100% accuracy. That means that they're going to spend 100,000 minutes evaluating this data set and labeling it, which is about 1,600 human hours. Uh, and if they're billing out at like $1,000 an hour, we're looking at conservatively around like $1.5 million before you get to your first prototype model. Like that's cost prohibitive for pretty much anyone unless you're Google. Um, this is precisely the problem. You know, these are the use cases that move the needle for most companies. These are the things that move the bottom line. But they're cost prohibitive to even get started. So this also doesn't even account for any iterations you might have to do. Again, we were living in a fairy tale land where we assume that all these you know, physicians were able to just annotate things perfectly the first time, but more likely than not, it requires several iterations. And each time you do this, it costs you know, a significant amount of money. And to add to this, data scientists are, are subject matter experts too. The time it takes to analyze and correct errors in labeling by data scientists is also very expensive, which compounds this problem even more. So in the labeling process, and I think this comes to, a surprise, to, to the surprise of no one, uh, the most expensive part of it is just human time being spent. And this is a problem across every vertical. Every single company in the world has a set of problems that are best solved using AI or ML, and they're not doing it, not because they don't have the AI or ML skill set, but because they can't get the data in a form that they can train those models. Uh, so for instance, in the medical space, like is this patient a good match for this clinical trial or not? Or is this tumor benign or malignant? Right? Again, these are use cases where the data must be labeled by experts, and probably two different types of experts in that case. Or in finance, is this transaction fraud? If so, what kind and how do we know? Uh, is this clause talking about indemnification? In insurance, is this claim high risk? Is there anything in this claim that's potentially fraudulent? Uh, again, the, the use cases go on and on, and, and more generally, as dependence on expertise increases, so does the likelihood that limited access to subject matter experts becomes a bottleneck. Now, in the cancer versus not cancer example I talked about before, I hand waved a pretty big part of the problem. Um, we assumed that every doctor was 100% accurate all the time. And we know as humans that that's very unlikely to be the case, but um, these nice people actually proved it. Um, as I mentioned earlier in this talk, uh, in the real world, there's often no such thing as ground truth. It just doesn't exist a lot of the time unless it's self-evident in the data. Um, this paper evaluated 10 of the most common data sets like ImageNet, MNIST, IMDB, Amazon Reviews, and others. They, they estimated an average error rate of about 3.4% across the data sets which is huge. I mean, that means that three out of 100 data points were incorrectly labeled. ImageNet is 14 million images, which means that roughly 450,000 of those images have incorrect labels. I mean, that's insane. And these are like the most prevalent data sets in the world. These are the data sets with the most eyes on them and the most citations throughout all academic literature. Imagine what's happening in the data sets of the average company. Naturally, the paper indicated that once the labels were corrected, overall model performance increased substantially. But even finding these errors is a non-trivial task, unless the labels themselves, again, are explainable or reproducible. And again, as I've reiterated ad nauseum by now, uh, in most cases, ground truth doesn't exist. 
The measurement of bias in machine learning often focuses on model performance across identity subgroups, um, you know, at least with respect to ground truth labels. Uh, however, these methods don't directly measure the associations that a model may have learned, uh, for example, between labels and identity subgroups. Uh, in the absence of ground truth, practitioners have to investigate more clever techniques to measure bias across subgroups and associations within the label space. Uh, so this particular paper proposes uh, normalized pointwise mutual information. Uh, they, they indicate that it's a promising approach for doing just that, where they determine a statistical measure of association that is used to derive the degree to which models have learned stereotype aligned associations regarding sensitive identity labels. So they figure out the co-occurrence between a particular identity, identity level and a negative outcome. And they determine if that's, you know, randomly distributed, normally distributed, or there seems to be a correlation that is in line with a negative stereotype. And this is just like an interesting thing that I found the other day. Um, I happened to stumble upon this, but apparently Distilbert loves movies filmed in India, but not in Iraq. There's likely several things that are happening here, like, um, you know, there, there's potentially model bias in that Distilbert was designed in a way where uh, at least a sentiment classifier can only classify into positive or negative. There's no neutral class. So it has to predict sentiment on these neutral statements, which makes no sense. So this could be model bias, for instance. On the other hand, statements like, um, I tried like, I was born in Germany, uh, that consistently yields a negative sentiment, which is a very, very interesting case you know, potentially of like biased model reflection due, significant, due to significantly leaked bias built up in the pre-training process. Um, so like even some of the most scrutinized and widely used models in the world have insane amounts of bias. Uh, so it's important to be able to like go backwards and figure out why that bias even existed. And again, fret not. There are lots of different ways we can evaluate this. Um, I'm not gonna go through every single one of these um, but I'll, I'll pick out a, a couple that I think are worth mentioning. Um, the axis here is scope of interpretation, ranging from local interpretation, or those focused on explaining specific predictions, uh, to global interpretation, or those you know, designed to explain entire models or distributions. Um, so a couple of these examples are counterfactual examples, Lime, global surrogate models, and SHAP. Um, those seem to be some of the more up and coming and most widely used uh, explainability techniques these days at least. Now, counterfactual explanations have become popular recently where they describe a causal situation in the form of if X had not occurred, Y would not have occurred. For example, if I hadn't taken a sip of this hot tea, I wouldn't have burned my tongue. Event Y is that I burned my tongue. Cause X is that I had hot tea. In explainable machine learning, counterfactual examples can be used to explain predictions of individual instances. The event is the predicted outcome of an instance. The causes are the particular feature values of that instance. A counterfactual explanation of a prediction describes the smallest change to the feature values that changes the prediction to a, pre to a predefined output. Lime produces similar types of explanations at the level of individual predictions, but in a different way. Lime was actually born out of a paper where the authors proposed a concrete implementation of local surrogate models, which are interpretable models that are used to explain individual predictions of black box machine learning models. So in, in the framework, Lime generates a new data set consisting of uh, perturbed examples, or perturbed samples rather, of a given data set and the corresponding predictions of a black box model. And basically what happens is a new interpretable model is trained on this data, and explanations are provided which measures how close this explanation is to the prediction of the original model. Global surrogate models takes this idea and applies it to the entire black box model itself, as opposed to just applying it to individual predictions. So surrogate models are interpretable models that are trained to approximate the predictions of a more complex black box model. Um, this technique is best used if an outcome of interest is expensive, time consuming, or otherwise difficult to measure. So if it costs you like a bunch of GPU time to inference against your like behemoth neural net, then it might make sense for you to like 
train a little decision tree that roughly approximates it. Um, a cheap, fast surrogate model uh, of the outcome can be used instead to approximate the predictions of the underlying model as accurately as possible and to be interpretable at the same time. And SHAP was proposed in 2016 as a method to explain individual predictions using techniques from game theory while still being extensible to global model explanations. So in SHAP, the feature values of a data point act as players in a coalition, where Shapley values tell, tell us how to fairly distribute the prediction among the features. The SHAP framework connects Lime and Shapley values and has a fast implementation for tree-based models. This makes it possible to compute the many Shapley values necessary for a global model interpretation, which includes feature importance, feature dependence, uh, interactions, clustering, and summary plots, and, and, and so on. There are tons of options here. And it really comes down to what types of techniques you are choosing to be your uh, quote unquote productivity engine in a given machine learning system. For instance, if you choose simpler modeling techniques to drive your label predictions, you can use techniques like SHAP as a performant way to explain these predictions and to provide information to the user for iteration. On the other hand, if you choose more complex modeling techniques, it might be useful to consider other ways to interpret these predictions, like using local or global surrogate models. So three things to kind of keep in mind here. Number one, you're never done labeling. Every single time you put a model into production, you must assume that that model will need to be retrained at some point. Depending on your use case, that could be sooner rather than later. For other use cases, it could be longer. Concrete examples. If you're training a model to do something like fraud detection, or uh, if you're in the cybersecurity space and you're trying to do intrusion prevention or something like that, you're fighting against an adversary who is incentivized to change their tactics quickly the moment they are detected. So as a result, you're gonna see drift frequently. This also happens in content moderation where um, the latest and greatest like alt-right dog whistle will show up all of a sudden. And now you've gotta like figure out why this benign word is suddenly like seen as like crazy racist. Um, so that is a concept of drift that happens more frequently than others, as opposed to something like the medical field or the legal field, where it moves a little bit more slowly, but there are still cases where you might have an acute event that causes a great shift, like with the pandemic. Uh, all of a sudden, a bunch of assumptions about uh, you know, epidemiology had to be shifted. Uh, so this is just some examples of when drift might occur. And again, you have to assume that you're never done labeling. Any model you put into production, if it's worth keeping it there, you're going to have to re like retrain at some point, which then means you have to relabel for it. What's more is that class definitions often change as labeling progresses. I don't know if anyone here has actually tried sitting down labeling some data, but usually your first 10 labels are gonna be strictly worse than your last 10. And that's just because you're discovering the class as you go. You know, you're, you're finding things out about the data. You don't have the full distribution in your head until you start playing with it. And that's just an interesting concept. That means that by nature, the first like several minutes or even hours of your labels might be of strictly worse quality than your last several minutes or hours. And that has effects on your model. And again, the cost of subject matter expertise compounds the cost of the overall pipeline. Once again, you're never done labeling, and as a result, if you need subject matter experts to be the labelers, then each and every time you retrain your model, you have to re-engage with those experts, and again, you're eating that cost over and over and over again, and it becomes just a fixed cost on this like long-running pipeline. Now, in terms of performance, because I think that's an important thing to consider here when you're thinking about automation techniques, even if getting machines to label much of your data really results in slightly noisier labels, your models are often better off with 10 times as many slightly noisier labels. Now, I'm painting with like a wildly broad brush here. Um, this is super dependent on your model architecture. If you're training smaller models, you need less overall data and therefore you'll see less benefit from scaling training sets. However, if you're training large data hungry models, you may see better performance training those models on lots of data, even if it means sacrificing a few points of accuracy, precision, recall, uh, et cetera, in the training data. Both of these papers go on to prove that, depending on model architectures, performance can be scaled. Uh, 
Uh, as training data sets become larger and contain distributions representative of the production data flow, uh, model performance tends to increase as well. So the key question isn't, should I hand label my, my training data or should I label it programmatically? Really, the question to be asked is, which parts of my data should I hand label and which parts should I label programmatically? Specifically, focusing human effort on the important parts of the long tail while making programmatic gains on the head is a promising approach to solving a fundamentally hard problem in every supervised machine learning pipeline. And just to sort of wrap up here, when thinking about labeling strategies, consider the following. Number one, explainable labels are important in being able to find and fix issues downstream in the modeling process. Number two, automation is important in being able to scale subject matter expert involvement in the labeling process. And number three, probabilistic evaluation is important in being able to accurately represent tasks in the real world. And what I mean by that is, again, there is no such thing as ground truth. So blindly categorizing things into zeros and ones will only hurt your model's performance if it's not representative of what's happening in the real world. There are cases, most cases, where there is ambiguity. And having that ambiguity as part of the, uh, of the labeling process will lead to better models because your model is able to find a richer relationship between the target value and the input. There are tons of ways that you could combine techniques we talked about today to have these three properties. Naturally, um, I have lots of opinions on the optimal combinations of these processes, uh, and I'm happy to talk about them at length in office hours today. So yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs>